What is going on everybody? It is Christian here and today I got another video going on for you. This one's kind of important as you're getting into filmmaking. Editing probably can be for some people very tedious. Not everybody enjoys it, but it is actually very important. Despite what people may think, editing can actually make or break your movie. There's been numerous times when editing has saved movies because the editor knows how to be a good storyteller. So they've rearranged the pieces they have and end up making something wonderful. Alternatively, they can break the movie. And if you do not know how to edit, you don't know how to pace and understand the flow of story structure, you can really ruin the movie completely. As filmmakers, most independent people and people starting out seem to forget how important it actually is. So I wanted to take the opportunity to kind of show people how to properly organize your editing your timeline so you can understand how to be more efficient. And being efficient makes you a better editor so you can kind of lay out the pieces. And ultimately, it the way I do it allows you to collaborate with more people because you're really cutting down all the crap and you're getting straight to the project. So if somebody looks at it, it is incredibly straightforward and very easy to do. So let's get right into that. So right here, I already have a pretty much a template folder set up for all my projects. Usually what I end up doing is copying this whole folder when I start a new project. This one is definitely more orientated to film specifically, this stuff, you can modify anything per project and keep that in mind. This is not a hard concrete kind of setup for things. Everything is gonna be depending on your project, but this works for me for pretty much everything. And yeah, well, let's get into explaining it. So the first thing's first. So as you can see right here with the project folder name, the way I like to organize my files is I like to have the actual project name where this project folder template is. And then I'll have the month and the year that I worked on that. And that's good. So when I archive stuff, it's pretty easy and straightforward to pretty much fine. You could you know, search it any which way. The only downside that this kind of doesn't work well is if you're working on a project long term. So that's kind of something you're going to have to work out. Usually I'll put the day I started it or not the day, but the month I started it or the month I ended it, depending. Um, but really, it's. It's up to you how you want to label that. So then going into the folder, so you can see we have a few folders here. So let's start with the easiest one at the bottom. This is temp. So temp, there's nothing going to be in, in this, but temp is basically where you want to keep files that you're either not sure 100% you want to use in this project, because there's been a lot of times when I've pulled in like audio assets just to try them out and I end up not using them. So here I put them in, in this folder and then pretty much this folder at the end of the whole project ends up getting deleted and cleared out. In the projects file, here, project file PP. I label this PP because sometimes when you get into it, uh, you start to work with After Effects files and other uh, file types here. So I'll label it PP just so at a glance I can tell this is Premiere Pro. But basically this project file here is a s pretty much set up already to go. The only thing I really need to do is add the files I'm editing and start working with it. It has a whole customized layout that I'm gonna get into after this to get straight into it. Miscellaneous. Miscellaneous is fun because this is all the random stuff. This folder usually ends up being the most chaotic if you don't take care of it because miscellaneous literally means all the random pieces, but generally speaking, I'll keep fonts specific for this project. And this is good to have, especially when you're uh, transferring this project to other people or archiving, you wanna make sure you have all these files. So when you bring the project file on different machines or later in the future, you're not scrambling to figure out where the heck you got these fonts from. LUTs, LUTs definitely are, they stand for lookup tables, but a lot of people have the misconception that LUTs are only really there to stylize your film. As you can see on this folder, I have it labeled camera LUTs. A lot of cinema cameras and even consumer grade cameras have a LUT that comes from the manufacturer. So if you're shooting in like log profiles primarily, the manufacturer will send you, or not send you, but they'll come with the camera that you could download or on a disc somewhere that you can load the slut into your editor and it would automatically kind of uh, color correct your files if you shot it appropriately in log and if you make sure your exposure is, is correct, the LUT will instantly work. So that's usually where I'll keep this. 
Um, this is like for red cameras, the Alexas and stuff like that. I'll usually keep those specific LUTs there. And then the rest of this folder will be dedicated to those stylistic LUTs for the project if they are used. And then overlays, I usually keep a set of overlay bars or letterbox bars, I should say. Um, I don't really use these that often, but they're good to have. I also have a uh, standard film grain overlay. This is just basic film grain. You can just download off the internet. This is kind of something I, from time to time, add for specific reasons and stylistic choices. Don't often use it, but I always keep it in the kit, essentially, just so I have it. And a rule of thirds, and the rule of thirds is cool because it's literally, uh, when I pull it up, just rule of thirds. You can stick it on top of your video files during editing and you can reference your composition. This is really good too if you're trying to readjust your images from either scaling or just repositioning it completely. You can use these overlays to kind of figure out if you're still st sticking within the compositional rules. And then media is obviously, you know, media. So you can have your audio footage, graphics, and stills. So breaking this down, let's go to audio first. So audio is broken down to dialogue and voiceover, which is pretty self-explanatory. This is pretty much where I keep all that. Music, music and sound effects is sound effects. They're all pretty straightforward. One thing that I like to keep part of the kit are these blank audio files. So I have five minutes of silence, 10 minutes of silence, and 45 minutes of silence. Literally all it is, it's just blank audio files, they're silence. I use these in editing as the dividers, so we'll get into that when I open up the project files to show you, but this is probably an optional thing. This is not something you have to do, and I'll explain it later why. Then footage, this can pretty much be as long as it needs to. I usually set up uh, four cameras minimum for the folder count, just so I have them on tap, but usually it'll be one or two cameras that I'm usually working with, um, which is A cam, B cam, and then I'll have a B-roll folder. You can have B-rolls from the other cameras, but I primarily like to have B-roll exclusively in the B-roll folder because it's not necessarily just for footage that I record. If I'm pulling stuff from stock websites, I can put all that stock stuff I've downloaded into the B-roll folder as well. So it's, it's organized and it's nice and neat and I could find, hey, I need specific B-roll, then I go there. And then graphics are for motion graphics and like just still image graphics. So like logos and just design elements. And then still folder is just still frames and photos taken from set. This again is gonna vary. I don't necessarily know why you would use this typically for still frames. Photos, they do take a lot of photos, but sometimes you'll need to export it and use them as like clean plates and stuff like that. So you can put them in there as well. And then exports is literally just exports. Every time you render a project, it goes in the exports thing. One thing you can notice here, I have Final Export. Now, Final Export is very specific. There's only one video file that ever sits in Final Export, and that is the Final Export. And the reason I have that there is just to be a very clear, specific reminder to put it in there. So that way it doesn't get mixed up with anything. And when I start to transfer media between people or if I upload it to um, like collaboration tools online, I make sure that I get the final version. And then every other one sits there and then I'll organize that further depending on the project. Sometimes I won't even have multiple exports. Sometimes I'll have a few, so that'll vary between projects. So now let's get into the actual Premiere Pro template. So I have pretty much everything laid out. So we're gonna start with the project files uh, manager over here. So first things first, you'll notice that this is pretty much exactly like the last folder setup, um, like standard. All the folders are pretty much still exactly the same. They're organized the same way. The only thing that's notably different is that overlays is now kind of ha has a primary role, the folder tree here. That way it sticks out because a lot of times overlays end up getting used multiple times. So I like to have it ready to go there. So breaking it down, I like to have also a sequence folder out here on its own because we're dealing with uh, timeline based stuff. So it's a lot of sequences. So I'll have the main sequence, which is everything I'm editing. I'll have a selects timeline and that might be uh, a few different timelines depending on the project. But essentially I will bring the raw footage into that timeline and then cut it up from there to then bring it into the main timeline. And then, yeah, pretty much everything else is the same from here. Um, so we'll get into the actual timeline. So mine is a bit overkill at times so we can see. So I'll have 17 audio tracks here and then I'll have 12 video tracks minimum. As far as video goes, I like to keep editing specifically to four tracks for my video. And that's just to cut down on the clutter. There's not really 
a reason to go above four tracks unless you're doing some kind of crazy crazy editing and you can edit any way you want but bear in mind that in future projects you might have to go through some of your own work or somebody else might need to take over so you want to keep it as organized as possible so when you do the handoff or you come back to it you're not scrambling to figure out what you did so then above this i'll have a after effects timeline so here with Adobe, you can do dynamic link with After Effects. So essentially you can load After Effects projects onto your timeline directly. So when you make changes in After Effects, it immediately reflects in Premiere. Now, the reason I keep this separate up here is because a lot of times that takes up a lot of processing power and time to kind of have it shuffle through with the rest of your project. So keeping it separate allows me to easily turn off these layers. So. Premiere would not even bother trying to render them and I can scrub through my timeline very efficiently. And then the same thing kind of applies above it. These next two are for motion graphics and titles and stuff. Same thing applies. Premiere does sometimes, depending on the situation, uh, take a little bit to kind of keep up and process with them. So it's, it's nice to be able to just turn off all the unnecessary stuff so you can get to straight to the video. And then this top one is basically a pre-render. So usually what I'll do is I'll edit my video and then I'll just render out the entire video without any sound or anything and I'll put it on top and the reason I do that is because then it allows me to turn off all these bottom layers so Premiere's not scrambling to to process any of those but then it'll let me focus on doing my audio because audio is arguably more important than some of the visuals so It'll let me work on sound design and lining up time, uh, sound effects, which is kind of important because if Premiere is lagging behind, your sound effects might not end up lining up, which is kind of like a big deal. I have 17 audio tracks laid up and then I have four sub mixes. So going into it, the first two tracks, this is literally for the default camera audio on video files or like in camera audio that goes here so most of the time none of this audio is going to be used but it's kind of a protective cushion because for those of you who don't know if you drag audio into a project with a footage sometimes your the footage you're dragging on that has audio actually cuts off the audio that was already laid down so it could actually end up messing up your whole project so having this is a really nice cushion and on top of that too in the off chance I'm using in-camera audio for whatever reason, for like dialogue that I end up needing to clean up, I can then move it to this bottom track here to remind me how important it is and keep it in sync with where the video clip came from so I can move it around. And then going here on the second grouping, this is all dialogue track. So kind of like before, but this is exclusively for dialogue track just to keep it organized. Um, so. If I'm trying to find other sound audio issues, I can just like mute dialogue and nobody's talking and it, it works out really well and I can just focus on dialogue here. Then these next ones here are for sound effects and your sound design. So I usually lay up a minimum five. It'll usually end up going more depending on the project, but five is a good starting point and this is all it is just to layer the audio tracks right here. Next one, this one is an optional one depending on your projects. I like to have it because it does make a difference in my opinion, but this is ambient noise. And so a lot of times what people forget is they don't properly uh, mix their audio and lay it correctly. So if there's gaps in the audio, you'll be able to hear the audio just disappear because of background noise. So it'll you'll hear some like background noise that you probably won't even notice. And then all of a sudden just real dead silence and then it'll come back up. So this is where I'll put ambience like room tones and other stuff like that here. And then these bottom tracks, are exclusively for music and for like soundtrack stuff that I'll just lay up here. And then the sub mixes, which are really nice, are grouped up to each one of these bottom rows. So the DX sub mix is for dialogue, SX is for all the sound effects, AX is for all the ambient noise, and then MX is for the music. So that makes it really easy because I can go in and apply effects, effects to each one of these individually and it'll affect every one of these grouping categories. So if I want to remove background noise from dialogue, I can hit them all in one go. And then obviously, you know, your master mix controls everything. So it keeps it straightforward and, and uh, really minimalistic um, as far as everything goes. And one thing you might be noticing is that I have these divided by these color bars. Now, 
these color bars are specifically optional because you can easily just do it with a locked layer. But I like to have them with colors to stand out. Now Premiere lets you create blank video files that you can lay up and extend as far as you want and label the colors and turn off the images and lock them. So that's no problem. But they don't let you make blank audio files. So that's where those blank audio files came into play that I showed you earlier. So you can basically do the same thing. You lay them off on your section, you color them, and then you mute and you lock them. And again, for blank, the blank video and the blank audio, you don't necessarily need to mute or turn off the eyeball on them, but I just do it for extra safety and then I lock them and you don't even have to worry about them anymore. This is for a short film called Oblivion that I did last year, or I forget when I did it, honestly. But as you can see, I have it pretty much laid out exactly like this. One thing that is noticeably different about this is I've kind of compressed it because there was only two motion graphics kind of elements in this, and that was the credits in the beginning and the end, which I've labeled yellow here. So I've kind of completely just cut that out, but everything else is pretty standard to how I like to edit. I will color everything by scene. And the reason I do this is so at a glance, I can see which, where the scenes break up. Um, these colors aren't hard colors exclusive to each scene, but they do just at a glance help you break it up. And then you can see right here, I have a mix. So I have a mix of two different scenes in here that you can easily see because one scene is green and the other scene is, I think, rose. And so this helps it up to an editing. So you'll know that, okay, not every clip here is part of the same scene which is super useful again going forward. And one thing else you'll notice is I like to stagger my cuts. So every cut has a stack, if I can help it. And again, the reason I do that is the same reason I have the colors. And so at a glance, if I look at it, I can see where a cut is. I don't always do that depending on what the, the file is, like you can see here and here, but it really makes a big difference, at least for me, that if I, at a glance, I'm looking at it and I can say, okay, there's a cut here, there's a cut here, there's a cut here, there's a cut here, and I can go to it really quickly and efficiently. For the most part, that sums up my entire uh, project file organization for the most part. Um, it's super straightforward. It looks complicated like always and anything when you're first starting out getting into it, but it makes a huge difference in the long run. As long as you keep your files organized, number one and more importantly, you can easily transfer your files to people. And that's kind of a big deal, especially when you're working with others, because sometimes you'll outsource your sound design or the music to somebody. And instead of them having to shuffle through all your audio files and try to figure out what you did, you can hand them the project file and say, hey, this is exactly what this is. And they'll be like, okay, cool, I've got it.